What is the shark doing in this scene? It's not just randomly swimming in circles, as you might think. It's acting like this because of its sensitivity to the electrical fields of the fish swimming near it. It uses this electrical field as part of a sensory system known as electroreception. What is electroreception? Let's talk about it in a bit more detail. The type of electroreception that sharks use is called passive electroreception. It is called passive because the shark is unable to produce electrical discharges of its own at will. Rather, it is simply able to sense the electrical fields of organisms around it, which are transmitted through ions in the water to pores that cover the shark called ampullae of Lorenzini. Ampullae are small pores that are distributed widely over the shark's body. They are sensitive to temperature, salinity, electrical fields, and mechanical forces such as touch, changes in current, and movements in water generated by swimming motions of other creatures. When any of these things disturbs the cilia contained in the pore, signal transduction takes place as neurotransmitters are released in the brain that signal the shark as to what is in the environment around it. Because the ampullae are distributed all over the shark's body and are triggered simultaneously by forces in the environment, the area of the body where most of the ampullae are triggered provides the sharks with information about the target location, whereas the strength of the signals it receives provides information about its distance to the target. How do we know that electroreception exists? Well, one scientist conducted an experiment in which a flounder was released into a tank with sand at the bottom. The flounder blended neatly into the sand, yet was swiftly detected, then devoured by the shark. Then, a second flounder was placed in the tank, but this time the flounder was contained in an agar chamber. The agar sequestered the flounder from the view of the shark, and as you know, sharks have poor eyesight anyways, which should have made detecting the flounder extremely difficult if the shark relied on sight or touch. However, agar conducts electricity well, and consequently, the shark located and devoured the flounder just as quickly as before. In a third trial, Pieces of dead flounder were placed in an identical agar chamber, which was then placed into the tank. The shark left them alone, but attacked the area where filtered water exited from the chamber, because that was where the elect concentration of fish odor was the highest. In the final trial, proving that electrical fields are the most important tool for sharks in hunting their prey, the electrical fields of flounder were measured, and then electrodes tuned to discharge fields of similar character were placed in the tank. Whenever the electrodes discharged, the shark attacked them, thus affirming the role of electroreception as a major sensory system of sharks. Interestingly enough, sharks are not the only creatures that utilize electroreception. In fact, a wide variety of sea creatures use it, including eels, jellyfish, and rays. So diverse is the array of species able to use electroreception that it is thought to have evolved in ancestors of these creatures on separate occasions in history. However, unlike sharks, creatures like eels have developed active electroreception, in addition to passive electroreception via ampullae, in which eels discharge electricity into their environment and then sense changes in the field using sensory organs known as tubulous receptors. These organs are sophisticated on many levels. Different receptors are tuned to different frequencies, just like the receptor cells in the ears of bats, so that the identity of incoming signals can be easily determined by which receptor is responding. Additionally, the receptors are tuned to detect frequencies of several hundred times higher than those that Nimpoli can detect, making them well suited to detecting the electrical organ discharges, or EODs, of other fish. How do these organs tell the fish about their environment? Objects and organisms near a fish will tend to disrupt the field produced by the fish's EOD. If the resistance of the nearby object or organism to electricity is greater than that of water, a localized reduction in the strength of the electrical field will occur, whereas the opposite will take place if the object or organism in question has a lower resistance to electricity than water. Fish will tend to be less resistant to electricity than water, whereas objects like rocks will have a much higher resistance. 
based on the localized increases and reductions in the strength of the field and the strength of the signals themselves, which determines the tar distance to target as before, the fish is able to create a clear picture of its environment. Note that the success of the system depends on the fish having a template that tells them what their electrical field is like normally, so that they are able to recognize when it is being distorted. As a template, some fish will emit a continuous wave at a constant frequency and will interpret their environment based on changes in the frequency of the wave. These are known as wave species. Others emit impulses, strong but brief bursts of electrical energy, and analyze distortions in the pulses in order to learn about their surroundings. They are known as pulse species. Because there are so many aquatic creatures giving off electrical fields, it is likely that if two such organisms met, the signals they get off might cause interference, inhibiting the ability of the fish to properly sense their environment. However, some fish use active electroreception in order to communicate with members of the same species, for example, during courtship. Therefore, they must preserve their own sensitivity to frequencies of other fish's EODs, while also being able to separate out their own, without encountering interference. For that purpose, some fish evolved a second kind of tubulous receptor known as a Nolan organ that utilizes separate neural circuits so that both systems of electroreception may coexist within one organism. This gets a bit more complicated for pulse species because their impulses contain a wide range of frequencies, which could potentially trigger all of the fish's electroreceptors unless the signal is distilled down to the one that is intended. How is the correct frequency separated out? Through the creation of an inverted copy of the ampullary response to the fish's EOD, known as the efferent copy, which is sent to the brain and then to the ampullase and summed with the signals of the ampullae, canceling them out and leaving the residual signals behind. Additionally, the Nolan organs use an efferent copy of the fish's EOD, which cancels out the fish's self-produced EOD rendering the Nolan organs sensitive only to the EODs produced by other organisms. Through efferent systems, the Nolan organs are successfully able to respond to the signals of other members of their species and temporarily prevents other electroreceptors from responding to the varied wavelengths in those signals. However, the efferent system alone does not protect them from interference. For pulse species, echoing the EOD of another fish is enough to prevent interference. However, this does not work for wave species, whose signals are continuously broadcast. When two wave species are near each other, something called the jamming avoidance response occurs. If the fish have EOD similar frequency, they will determine which has the higher frequency. The high frequency fish will then temporarily increase the frequency of its EOD, while the low frequency fish will temporarily lower the frequency of its EOD, thereby differentiating them. What do electroreceptors say about a perception of reality? We should first consider the nature of the system. It is not merely a series of isolated sensory inputs that produce isolated motor outputs. The inputs are continuously taken in, and the outputs are continuously produced as a result. The motor outputs modify the position in and the perspective on the environment as well, creating a reciprocal relationship between the two. This is best exemplified by the process of retinal stabilization described by Howard Hughes in his book, Sensory Exotica. Our ability to see is dependent on small movements of the eye. If our eye were kept perfectly still, no image would be produced. This is supported by the process of retinal stabilization, in which a machine moves an image to always be centered on the retina of the subjects of the experiment. When the image is centered on the retina, it disappears. This raises an important question. If our perception is dependent on sensory data that is continuously changing, that cannot be held constant, then how can we pinpoint anything as being real? Additionally, the shark experiment raises an important question. If the brains of sharks can be so easily fooled by human contraptions, no less, there is nothing to say that we cannot be fooled in the same manner on a regular basis by other organisms. While that is an unlikely occurrence, it calls to mind the story of the four blind men and the elephant, and raises the question of how we can so firmly rely on our own perceptions of reality when our perceptives are so limited.